And I just um, I just want to say before we welcome our online, there's nothing better than being in the house and actually in the front few few rows because you see some things that you guys don't see. So Lord, and I don't know, I'm going to lose the camera in a minute. You had a little, I hope you'll be right when I pick him up. You had a little protege this morning. And I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe how in time he was drumming <laughs> to Lawton as we sung that last song. There is nothing better, nothing better than that baby. So give him a hand, come on, give him a hand. <laughs> Our drummer. <laughs> you go down and see Mama. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. No, I got it. We're, we're in this, uh, oh, sorry, a warm welcome this morning, and um, particularly for those that have chosen today to stay home and uh, watch online, a just a warm welcome. It's uh, just been, it's been lovely to be in God's presence this morning and enjoy His presence, and um, uh, we trust that you're enjoying our service online. And uh, I really pray that you hook into our message and uh, just listen and, again, just be open to what God's Spirit, I believe, is saying to us as a church. Uh, most of you that have been here regularly or are watching online regularly will be aware that we're in a series called Blueprint where we've been looking at the ecclesia, the, the word that Jesus used that has been poorly translated, the church. Uh, it was not Jesus' intention to establish a building or an institution or an organization. That was not what he had in mind, and it was not the word that he actually used. He used the word ecclesia, which means an assembly or a gathering of people tasked with a task to do, and this task had a governmental role. It was to govern and reign, and in Jesus' case, to govern and reign in a way that reflects his kingdom. And the Word church does not capture that at all, all right? So we've been in this series kind of redefining, called it Ecclesia and redefining what God has called us to do. And I want to say, those who, of you that know me and know how kind of structured and organized I am around my messages, on Monday, I, I, this, this message was not in the three parts that I was doing of the series. Didn't even have it in my head. And, and, and God dropped it, luckily on Monday, not Saturday night, because I'm a very structured person, into my head, and I really felt that I just needed to change the tack and talk about this topic this morning. It's entitled, The Language That Language Determines Our Culture. And when, when we started, when I actually started the Blueprint series, the first talk that I did, we looked at what the church is and what it's not, what it isn't. And the first point I made, I want to pick up again this morning. The first point I made was that the Ecclesia is a movement, not a religion. It's a movement, not a religion. I stated at the time that Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. That wasn't his intent. He didn't even come to modify the existing Jewish one. Yes, he came to fulfill the Old Testament law and prophets, but he filled them, fulfilled them by establishing something completely new. Jesus' ethos, he said time and time again, you cannot put new wine into old wineskins. He wasn't talking about the age of some people. He was talking about the structures that carry, the, the stuff that carries this new movement that God was birthing in Jesus of his spirit that would move on people and on the earth. And he was saying the old structures cannot carry this new movement. New wine needs new wineskins. And that's what he was telling us to do. One of the most striking things about Jesus was the language that he continually used to describe this new movement. Jesus knew that language determines a culture. The language we use in the environment will determine the culture of that environment, whether we realize it or not. And that's what we're going to look at today. 
It always does. What stands out in the Gospels is the, is the language, or, or what stands out in the Gospels is that there was a different language for religion than the language that Jesus used to describe this new movement that he was instigating. And I believe this is really crucial for us to understand because we can end up 2,000 years later using terminology that reflects a religious mindset rather than the clear thinking and teaching and theology of Jesus. And people, this is crucial for us to grasp and understand, particularly around issues, theological issues, thinking issues of what is God like? I think we slip into so many times just picking up language that has been part of a religious culture and applying it to the ecclesia, and we end up painting God by the language and thoughts and expressions, the things we say. Just They almost flow off our tongue naturally sometimes, and we've got to stop and think. What, what are we saying about God when we say some language? It's important to understand this for things like, what is God like? Does God hate certain people? Does God treat some people as excluded by what they do or have done? Or does he welcome everybody? What's our language like? What does it even mean to be a Christian? And so often we use terminology and thinking that slips into religious thinking, not the message of Jesus. And we can end up even creating controlling church cultures that operate more like a Christian version of the Old Testament, Jewish religion, than the message and the ministry of what Jesus called into being in this new movement, that we carry the new wine of his spirit. So, so this morning, this is a topic you've probably never covered. So this morning, I want to look at the language of religion as opposed to the language Jesus used for this new movement. Are you with me, people? Online and in the house? So here's the first thing. The language of religion generally tends to be either in or out language. It's them or us language. And what determines whether you're in was often defined by the language they used and the structures that they put in place to enforce it. It was based around laws, religion is, around rules and rituals. It's based around performing a certain set of behavior standards. And then there was punishment or penalties for breaking these rules and separation from the group if you didn't conform or wouldn't conform. It was very clear who was in and therefore who was out. It was very clear who we were and therefore who they were. But Jesus spoke a different language, an incredibly different language, the language of what I'm calling the ecclesia, his, his gathering that he was going to establish. And this assembly of people, this gathering, this new movement had a different language. First of all, it was radically inclusive. Everybody was welcome. Everybody was included if they wanted to be. Secondly, or next, whereas the language of religion was based around laws, the, the language of this new movement was based around love. Love God and love others as you love yourself. And if you do that, Jesus was saying to this group of people, you will obey every other law. There's only one law in the kingdom of God. It's the law of love. If you love God passionately with all of your heart, mind, and soul, and love others as you love yourself, then you'll obey all of the Old Testament law and prophets. It's not a set of rules. It's not laws. It's love, the language of Jesus. Whereas religion was all about rules, this new movement was about relationship. You see, God had never, he had never turned his back on humanity. It was us, it was we, who turned our back on God and hid because of shame and guilt. God has never turned his back on us. God has continually been searching for us, 
wanting to restore the relationship. Everything that God has done has been towards the restoration of our relationship with Him. It's us. It's us people who creates creates futile religions to try and work our way back to God in our own way, our own right, our own terms, so that we can control it. God has always passionately been about bringing us back to God. Not in my notes, and I don't want to go too deep, but it's interesting to track where religion and rules started. When God offered the people a direct relationship with him through Abraham's message, it was the people that says, no, 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 we're scared of God. You have the relationship, and then tell us what to do. It was the beginning of a religion instead of a relationship. You see, you need to know that God has always sought his relationship with each one of us. It's a God who says, just come, come. Find what you are created to be and who you were created to be. Come back to me. Again, religion's based on performance with clear guidelines of what you need to do to be in favor. It it, it differs depending on which religion you want to follow, but the point of all religions is clear that you need to do certain things, climb certain steps, get to do certain ways of earning God's favor, again as if his favor is not extended to us. We've got to earn it. We've We've got to follow certain habits or rules or regulations to get the favor of God. That's how religion works. It's marketed it well. Whereas this new movement that Jesus birthed is based not on performance, but the abiding presence of God. He is with us. And the message of Jesus, we're now 2,000 years on that side of that, but the message of Jesus, he is with you. And soon, soon, people, he will be in you. And his presence will be over you and around you. This is the message of Jesus. You do not need to perform favors to get God. God's presence is with us. You do not need to earn it, people. In fact, there's nothing you can do to earn the favor of God. It's already done. It was done on a cross 2,000 years ago. His favor has always been extended to you. He has always been about restoring his relationship and bringing his presence into your life. People, you do not work for his favor, or if, and if you do, you should stop right now. Stop working for the favor of God. Work from his favor. Work, work from a place of favor with God. That's what he wants you to do. He says, I want to co-labor with you. I want to co-reign with you. You are my children when you turn to me and come my way. And when you come to me, you become a child of the living God, a son or a daughter, a prince or a princess. And we get to work with God, to co-labor with God in this beautiful rhythm that he's called us to. That's what he's calling each one of us. And this is where a religion is different from the ecclesia, which is a relationship. Also, religion works on the basis of, I'm in, and you're out. Obviously not you, because you're all in, but someone else is out. And if you break the rules, you'll be punished and separated. Religion creates a divide between them and us. We're Protestants, you're Catholics. We're Christian, you're Muslim. Whereas the Ecclesia, in Christ, God extends forgiveness and seeks the restoration, listen people, of all people and everything. All things and everything on heaven and earth. Colossians 1 and verse 20. And if you want another verse, here it is, 2 Corinthians 5 And verse 19, it says, For God was in Christ, not distance from Christ, in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin, 
That's another topic we'll pick up some other time, what sin is too, because we have religified and stuffed it up so often. We've created an angry God who looks at us because we do things wrong. Sin is a problem in our world. Don't join an email to me about, oh, you just making sin easy. No, I'm not. Sin's the biggest problem we face. But if we don't clearly understand what sin is, we will not understand God. And we'll create an angry God again because of our own theology. Anyway, sorry, that wasn't on my notes. Here we go. Here's another thing. So God is reconciling the whole world. Everything in the world. Colossians 1 and verse 20, if you're taking notes, talks about everything on high in the heavens and the earth below. See, God's bringing everything relationally back to himself. So here's another thing. All the words that are used to describe the ecclesia are relational by nature. Think about it. A family. We're all part of a family. It's a beautiful expression of what Jesus was setting in place. You are my gathering. And another place Paul talks about, it's a family. It's a family of God. And everyone that comes to Christ is in that family. It's an inclusive family. It's a relational term. Another term they use is your parts of human body. Christ's body. God's body. And you're a part of it. And everybody has a part to play in this body. You're all included. It was never God's intention that you had clergy and laity, that you had people who were paid to do things and people who weren't. We are all important. He needs every one of us for his body to function well. And it's a beautiful terminology, but it's a relational terminology. We're parts of a family. We're a part of a body. And then a community with a common purpose and common interests. Even the stories, people, that Jesus told were all about relationship restoration. Think about it. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. God's desire, as Jesus painted the picture, is time and time again that God has a heart for the lost. They are worth searching for, worth waiting on. And when they come to him, Jesus, there is great celebration when they come home. And find their place in the person of God. Or he would say, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. The Greek word for saved, sozo, can also mean healed. See, Jesus would say there is a sickness that pervades the human soul. It's come into the human soul and it affects every part of our body. And we need to be healed. Some of the most beautiful illustrations is the blind need to get sight. See, once I was and you were too, we were blind. But the story of our relationship with Jesus is now we can see. We were lame. But he brings a healing touch and now we can walk with him. Sometimes with a limp. But we walk with him. And everything he's calling us to be and do. You see, we need a physician, not a judge. In the New Testament, the most common language used to describe this called out group of people were were terms like liberation and freedom. They're beautiful terms. And And when they were used, and when Jesus would use them in the New Testament, writers would use them. They would take their Jewish audience straight back to their roots, to their history. History. It would take them back to the time in Egypt where they were in bondage for some 400 years, slaves in Egypt. And it would take them back to the amazing story, the story that paints the picture of salvation from God's perspective that we are in slavery and Moses, through God through Moses, liberates them. You know the continual theme, if you read the story, I think it says it six or seven times. It's the reason why they wanted to be liberated. Do you know the line? So that we can freely worship God. So Jesus is telling us in these kind of terms that will be so familiar to his Jewish audience, this liberation and freedom terminology that he would use. And the people would know we're trapped in slavery to sin and bondage to sin. 
Jesus offers a message of freedom so we can be liberated to finally, finally be everything that God created us to be and worship Him the way He created. They were beautiful messages. Paul and, and most of the New Testament writers, authors, picked up the same theme time and time again, and they would use terminology like this. Christ has come to rescue us from the kingdom of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of His dear Son. There's this beautiful picture of liberation. We were slaves to Satan, to sin and death. But now through Christ, we have been liberated so that we can be free. Why? Not for freedom's sake, people, but that we can be free to be the people who God created us to be, to worship him freely and live the kind of life that he's calling and called each one of us to be, oh, people. Come on. You know, it's very clear if you read the Gospels, and, and I, I make this strong statement, but read the Gospels and prove me wrong. It's very clear if you read the Gospels that the language of salvation was relational and redemptive. Jesus never explained the salvation terminology. He never had one simple way either, but it's through Jesus, I am the door, but there were lots of ways people could enter that door. Through Jesus. He was the way, people. But he never explained it in terms like you've broken the rules and you need punished. You will never find that in the Gospels. It was redemptive. It was restorational. It was relational. We are alienated from the presence of God and he comes to bring us back to the presence of God. So Jesus, Jesus was constantly, people, in conflict with the religious Jewish leaders of the day. He was in conflict all of the time with them, people. And probably there were about three main issues. First, his lack of respect for the Jewish culture of the day. He was very disrespectful of it. Second, who he associated with. He associated with people who were not in, who were out. And not only were they out, but they were badly out from the in people's perspective. They were sinfully out. Yet Jesus associated and enjoyed the, his company with them. And lastly, he was in trouble because of his view of Father God. He didn't paint a picture that was the religious picture that was very helpful to maintain their structure and their system. Because if God is angry, then I can be angry and create all sorts of rules for you to jump and follow. It maintains a sense of control. And people, we do this in Christianity so easily sometimes. Correspondingly, Jesus was harsh, very harsh, in his condemnation of the Jewish leaders. He would say, you are the very ones who were meant to lead the people, the sheep, by pointing them to a relationship with their Father God who loves them. But instead of pointing them to me who loves them passionately, you created a religion of rules and rituals and systems. You created a God who was distant and detached, a strict rule keeper and a judge who punished people who couldn't keep the rules. You tainted God with your terminology and your culture. And Jesus was very tough because they were the people like us, that should be pointing people to God through Jesus. Jesus knew, like you know, that you cannot truly love and draw near to someone that you fear. You cannot foster a relationship with someone who's always checking on your performance to make sure that you're adequate enough to have your friendship. What kind of person would you do that with? So what would we do it with God? Probably the most radical way Jesus redefined people's view of God was to teach them to think that God is not only a sovereign, gracious king, but he is a loving father. He's your loving father. And one of the most significant lessons that Jesus taught his followers and therefore taught us 
was to stop looking for God's life in the regiment of rituals and rules and religion. It cannot, it cannot, Jesus would say, be found there. God calls you and me to him. And in faith, a relationship based with him where his spirit indwells us and leads us in this beautiful rhythm called following him and being one of his disciples. Praise, can I call you? Come on, let's wind this up. You with me, people, still? Now, I I don't want you to get me wrong because I want to make this point. Jesus was not, and I don't mean to be frivolous. I love Jesus passionately, right? But Jesus was not this kind of hang loose, mean God are okay, happy type person who just wanted to do God and him. That was not what Jesus was like, all right? Jesus was a very disciplined, very motivated, very focused person. He woke up every morning before sunset, and he would, sunrise, sorry. Thank you, dear. (laughs) He was a, He woke up early in the morning, all right? (laughs) Long before this pastor does, he woke up. He was very disciplined, and he spent time just walking in the presence of his loving Heavenly Father. His day, every day, it seems, and his ministry was filled with the needs of people. He he healed the sick. He, He feared those who were hungry. He brought sight to the blind. He even raised the dead. It was part of his daily routine. He would even, I want to suggest he was quite structured because he would even at times send the disciples on ahead to prepare for where he was going to be in his next place. And they would get stuff organized for the presence of the Messiah to come. And he instigated certain rituals. So I'm not poo-pooing rituals, people. The problem is not rituals. Jesus prepared some beautiful rituals, communion, the Lord's Supper being one, baptism another. He, He encouraged us to form rituals and rhythms in our life, not to please God in some religious way, but to pursue the presence of this relationship with our loving God. That's why he would call certain times to, you need to get away. You need to fast and detach from the world around you and attach to your relationship with me, God, your loving Heavenly Father. He, he, He called us to those things. Everything flowed out of relationship with God and then into relationship with each other around him. He he didn't follow a religious system or a structure. And people, people, I want to finish by saying that's what Jesus calls us to. He he says to each one of us, just come. I, I, I wish we would redo some of our language about following Jesus and what it means to be a Christian. I think the most beautiful word is just come, come, come follow me. That's what Jesus would say. Come, I'm the way, I'm the life, I'm the door. Just just come. And and then he, again, just felt this to say that the the beautiful terminology says, I am the gate. And people come in, we stop there. The next few verses say something like this, and then they will go in and out and find pasture. It's not a narrow, restrictive gate. It's, 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 it's narrow in the sense, if you want to make it narrow, as Jesus said, there's only one way in. But what we do is we come in and then we become incredibly narrow. We come in through the gate, it's uh, through the cross of Jesus. But when we come in, there is life and we can go in and out minister and the presence of God goes with us it's a narrow entrance but broad pastures broad way 
That's what he calls us to. And he calls us to, to join with him. Just before we sing, I want to I read how the message translation puts one of the statements of Jesus. It says this, Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. Are you tired? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me, Jesus said. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. Listen, I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live lightly and freely. Do you want to stand, people? Come on. I believe it's a word for some of us this morning.